The KGB, one of the world's most effective security agencies. The KGB, the State Security Committee of the former Soviet Union, was dissolved in 1991. This Moscow square in front of KGB headquarters was named Zezhinsky for the first Bolshevik security chief. It is now called Lubyanka, back to its original name. Yet even now, the KGB means secrecy, fear, and evil. The Soviet security organization functioned under several names for more than 70 years. It was a powerful and oppressive agency feared by the entire Soviet population. An investigation of the KGB's past provides us with insights into its being. The KGB and its predecessors have played a major role in the history of Russia. After the October Revolution, the Bolsheviks needed a secret police organization. Their party was small and unpopular, and it seemed obvious they could lose power as easily as they had seized it. On December the 7th, 1917, at Lenin's insistence, the Soviet of People's Commissars established the All-Russian Extraordinary Commission for Fighting Counter-Revolution and Sabotage, the infamous Cheka. Felix Zezhinsky was appointed its chairman. Born in 1877 to the family of a poor Polish nobleman, Zezinski received a religious education. In his teens, he joined the revolutionaries and was arrested and imprisoned repeatedly. He was selected for the Bolshevik Central Committee in 1906 and was a member of the Military Revolutionary Committee, which masterminded the events of October 1917. Zezhinsky passionately believed that the Bolshevik cause must succeed at any cost. He was known both as the most honest knight of the revolution and as the inquisitor general. Stalin would say of him, for the bourgeoisie, there was no name more hated than his. The chairman of the Cheka had almost no staff or reliable agents. Only a few of the first 20 men would remain in Zezhinsky's inner circle, among them Yakov Peters, Ivan Xenofontov, and Martin Latsis. The Bolsheviks gave the Cheka many extremely important assignments. Russia was waiting for the Constituent Assembly to meet and lay the foundations for a new political system. Many people hoped this would end Bolshevik power. Opposing parties prepared for a parliamentary struggle.
But the Bolsheviks did not intend to lose power to the lawfully elected assembly. In December 1917, Cheka agents arrested the members of the Union for Defending the Constituent Assembly. On January the 5th, 1918, Bolshevik troops crushed a demonstration of its supporters. The assembly convened in the Torid Palace. The next day, guards headed by Cheka agents barred delegates from the building. That night, two delegates, Andrei Shingaryov and Fedor Kokoshkin, arrested earlier, were brutally murdered by drunken Red Guards. The killing shook the country, and the Cheka was forced to arrest the two murderers. But somehow they managed to go unpunished, and the case was closed. This incident was a preview of things to come. The Cheka would become expert in mob manipulation and violent death. The Bolshevik situation was precarious. In February 1918, the Soviet Republic hovered on the brink of military defeat. Petrograd was threatened. Lenin signed a decree. The Soviet homeland is in danger. Now, Cheka agents could shoot on the spot enemy agents, thugs, speculators, counter-revolutionary agitators, and German spies. The Cheka could execute anyone. No proof of guilt was required. This allowed them to maintain strict discipline in the rear of the Red Army. Some of those executed were criminals who posed no threat to the Bolshevik regime. The vast majority were political opponents, a far greater danger to the revolution. The summer of 1918 was a particularly violent period in the Bolshevik struggle for absolute political power. And again, the Cheka played a key role. On July the 4th, the 5th Congress of Soviets convened in Moscow. The left SRs, a political party led by Maria Spiridonova, harshly criticized the Bolsheviks. The Cheka retaliated. On July the 6th, Yakov Blumkin, a member of the left SR party who was also a Cheka agent, assassinated Count Mirbach. Lenin accused the left SRs of attempting to provoke war with Germany. When Zezhinsky tried to arrest the assassin, he found that some Cheka people were loyal to the left SRs and refused to obey his orders. He and several other Bolshevik leaders were arrested. Fighting followed. The odds were against the SRs. Two days later, reinforcements under Yakov Peters, Zezhinsky's deputy, quelled the uprising and arrested the left SR leaders. Mirbach's killer had a long career with the Cheka. As a result of the July uprising, the Bolsheviks consolidated political power but they were not yet secure. The next step was organized terror. In Zezhinsky's words, an absolutely natural element of the revolution. The Bolsheviks waited for their opportunity to launch the Red Terror. 
On August the 30th, Mosei Uritsky, chairman of the Petrograd Regional Cheka, was killed. In Moscow, Lenin was shot and wounded. The SRs were blamed for both attacks. Retribution was so fast and well organized that many historians believe the attacks were orchestrated by the Cheka. An hour after Lenin was wounded, with no reliable information about the attack, Yakov Sverdlov announced that the working class will retaliate with mass terror against all the enemies of the revolution. Grigory Zinoviev, chairman of the Petrograd Soviet, said, the bourgeoisie can kill several people. We can kill an entire class. In Petrograd, immediately after Yuritsky's death and the declaration of Red Terror, 500 hostages were shot. A wave of execution swept the country. Now, local Cheka units consisting of only Bolsheviks were extremely efficient. Gradually, the all-Russian extraordinary commission intruded into every part of society. Offices were opened in small towns and remote regions. In February 1919, Mikhail Kedrov headed the special department to fight counter-revolution and espionage in the army and navy. The Cheka now had its own large military units. The list of crimes for which the Cheka could punish at its discretion was expanded. The Cheka had almost no limits on its formidable power. In early 1919, Dzerzhinsky and Stalin inspected the Eastern Front together. They agreed on the importance of the secret police organization and understood its potential. Fear of the Cheka had not yet paralyzed the Bolsheviks' political opponents. On September the 25th, 1919, a powerful bomb exploded in a downtown Moscow street. The 50-pound charge gutted the building where the Moscow Party Committee was in conference. Moscow Bolshevik leader Vladimir Zagorsky and 11 others died. 55 were wounded. Trotsky and Kamenev eulogized the dead. Meanwhile, the Cheka had begun its work. At first, Dzerzhinsky suspected that the SR party and the National Center were responsible for the bombing. Hundreds of members of these organizations in custody on other charges were shot immediately. But soon investigators headed by Moscow Cheka leader Vasily Mantsev discovered that the anarchist underground was guilty. In two weeks, secret apartments, publishing facilities, and explosives workshops were wiped out. No one questioned the erroneous executions. Most Cheka people did not consider them a mistake. Even among the Bolsheviks, no one was brave enough to challenge the Cheka in public, although privately they observed that their slogan all power to the Soviets had been changed to all power to the Cheka.
Yet many believed this was justified by the Soviets' dangerous military and political situation. Every civil war victory was costly. Discontent permeated the country and flared up everywhere. The Bolsheviks labeled the outbreaks counter-revolutionary conspiracies. Lenin gave important new tasks to Iron Felix. Still head of the Cheka, he also became People's Commissar for Home Affairs. At the same time, he settled labor conscription issues and headed the Commissariat for Communication Means. Frontier guards were subordinated to the Cheka. Later, Dzerzhinsky took part in diplomatic affairs and became a member of the Science Committee. All important matters of state were controlled by his secret service. It was obvious that the Cheka's primary targets were not the enemies of the working class, but anyone opposed to Bolshevism. Beginning in 1918, the Soviets requisitioned surplus food from the peasants. Special armed Cheka food units forced compliance and often completely stripped villages of any provisions. Those who tried to hide bread and grain were executed on the spot. Peasant uprisings became common. In 1920 and 21, peasants in the Tambov region, led by Alexander Antonov, launched a guerrilla war against the Bolsheviks. The Soviet government responded with punitive raids. Regular Red Army troops fighting against Antonov were reinforced with special Cheka detachments, including the armored vehicle unit organized by Dzerzhinsky himself. Relatives of the rebels were taken hostage. A network of prison camps was set up throughout the region. Families of guerrillas who would not surrender were exiled or shot. The climax came when Cheka agents infiltrated Antonov's headquarters and the peasant uprising was mercilessly crushed in the summer of 1921. That same year, the Bolsheviks put down one other challenge to their power the uprising by sailors of the naval base at Kronstadt. When Cheka action could not subdue the rebellious sailors, army units decided the outcome. The Cheka finished the job. Many rebels were shot. Others were imprisoned or exiled. This happened shortly before May Day. In 1921, Russia experienced a horrendous famine that caused five million deaths. People in the Volga region ate grass. Cannibalism was documented. Peasants fled from their villages, trying to survive. The civilized world was shocked and tried to help. Anatole France donated his Nobel Prize to famine relief. 
the American Relief Administration was founded to supply Russia with food. Norwegian Arctic explorer Fritjof Nansen visited the famine areas and called for a relief effort. But the Cheka was convinced that relief efforts were only veils for espionage. The members of American Relief Administration were under constant Cheka surveillance, even at official gatherings. Many were arrested. The Russian Orthodox Church, headed by Patriarch Tikhon, collected donations for the starving peasants. But the Bolsheviks feared this undermined their authority and banned the church's efforts. The Soviet government then founded the State Committee for Famine Relief. And the committee requested the church to donate all treasures not used in religious services. In effect, this was a requisition of all church wealth masterminded by the Cheka. Patriarch Tikhon appealed in vain to the government and tried to complain to Lenin about the tyranny of the Cheka. He was unaware of Lenin's letter to all local authorities, urging them to shut down all churches and kill as many priests as possible. The Patriarch's insistence resulted in his house arrest and subsequent confinement in the Donskoy Monastery, and eventually in his untimely death in 1925. By that time, the Orthodox Church was almost completely controlled by the state. After eight years of Bolshevik rule, most churches were destroyed or desecrated. Of 96 churches in Petrograd, only seven remained open. Monasteries became labor camps for thousands of socially alien clergymen. The state treasury absorbed the church's assets, worth millions of golden rubles, but never used them for famine relief. The Bolsheviks favored other means. A special Cheka train was sent from Moscow to Siberia. It carried food raiders commanded by Dzerzhinsky himself. His aides were authorized to requisition foodstuffs by any means and to transport the food back to European Russia. When Zezhinsky returned from his bread trip in February 1922, he was no longer chairman of the Cheka. He was now chairman of the principal political agency, the GPU, formed within the People's Commissariat for Home Affairs, the NKVD. With the end of the Civil War, the Bolsheviks sought to demonstrate that the Cheka's extraordinary powers were no longer necessary. Political administration was most important. The Soviet regime destroyed those who openly resisted them and searched for secret adversaries. Dzerzhinsky's solution was simple. The GPU should become a successor of the glorious deeds and traditions of the Cheka. In the summer of 1922, he planned a trial against the imprisoned SR leaders. This was a precursor of the show trials staged by Stalin in the 30s.
Georgi Pietakov presided at the trial. Nikolai Krylenko and Anatoly Lunacharsky were prosecutors. Spectators in the Supreme Court Hall were mainly GPU agents in civilian clothes. The GPU meticulously prepared for the trial. Some of the defendants were coerced and pled guilty, implicating their former comrades, members of the SR's Central Committee. Two provocateurs, Grigory Semyonov and Lydia Konoplyova, had infiltrated this compliant group. Nikolai Bukharin, who defended this group, was virtually controlled by the prosecution. The charges, which ranged from unleashing the civil war to the attempted assassination of Lenin, were unfounded. Yet Krylenko demanded the death penalty. Things did not go exactly as planned. The architects of the trial were disappointed. The defendants were not frightened and would not confess. They refused to plead guilty and accused the Bolshevik regime of political tyranny and the torture of witnesses. The government dared not approve the death sentence. Lev Kamenev suggested that execution be postponed indefinitely, and the 12 SRs became prisoners for life. The SR trial proved an embarrassment for the GPU, which was to be more successful in the activities of the Commission for Children's Life Improvement, established in 1921 and headed by the tireless Dzerzhinsky. According to People's Commissar for Education, Luna Chasky, Dzerzhinsky believed that the Commissariat for Education was inadequate and needed Cheka expertise. The problem was extremely serious. Civil war reprisals and forced migrations created a huge number of orphans. Six million of these children without homes and families roamed Russia's roads and filled its cities. Cheka objectives in founding the commission were not only to improve living conditions for the children, but to curb juvenile delinquency. Special orphanages were built throughout Russia under the supervision of the Cheka GPU. They provided shelter, clothes, food and elementary education. Most important, however, the children were placed under control. Juvenile delinquents were sent to reformatories, where labor was the common means of correction. The most notorious reformatory was named for Felix Dzerzhinsky and directed by Anton Makarenka. In December 1922, the Soviets celebrated the fifth anniversary of their secret service. Crack GPU troops paraded in Red Square and a grand celebration was held at the Bolshoi Theater where Mikhail Kalinin spoke. The entire humankind must thank the Cheka, he said. The first badge of the honorable Cheka officer was presented to Dzerzhinsky. A few days later, when the first Congress of Soviets of the recently founded USSR was convened, the party central committee decided to rename the Secret Service once again. The GPU became the OGPU, the United States Political Agency.
This organization was to watch not only over Russia, but over the entire Soviet Union. Dzerzhinsky became a member of the Soviet government. From that time on, all heads of the secret police would be positioned into the highest bodies of party and state. In 1923, the OGPU faced numerous opponents outside the USSR. The enemy occasionally resorted to terrorist attacks. Prominent Soviet diplomat Václav Ferovsky was shot point-blank in Lausanne. In Russia, the OGPU, famous for its own terrorist tactics, decried the murder and orchestrated a public protest against political assassination. The West found it difficult to cope with OGPU foreign intelligence, which was headed by Mikhail Trelissa after 1922. Soviet influence was especially strong in Persia and Afghanistan. But the primary target for the OGPU was within the Soviet Union. Lenin was seriously ill, and the choice of a successor was critical. As the power struggle within the party intensified, Lev Trotsky, Nikolai Bukharin, Lev Kamenev, Grigory Zinoviev, and Mikhail Tomsky seemed the strongest contenders. But only three people wielded real power. Trotsky controlled the Red Army, Dzerzhinsky, the OGPU, and Stalin, the party apparatchiks. Hatred of Trotsky united Stalin and Dzerzhinsky. In December 1923, Dzerzhinsky branded Trotsky's supporters as enemies of the party who had no place in the OGPU. January the 21st, 1924, Lenin died. During the next six days, as the Soviet people mourned the Bolshevik leader, the party central committee decided who would wield power. Dzerzhinsky headed the commission for Lenin's funeral. Five days later, he took over the Supreme Soviet of People's Economy without resigning from his primary position as head of the OGPU. Stalin remained General Secretary of the Bolshevik Party. Lenin had adamantly opposed this, but with the help of the OGPU, his last will and testament was concealed from the party rank and file. In 1924, the political agency had become a well-organized institution with hundreds of thousands of official and secret employees, a multitude of services and departments, and a large contingent of troops, surpassing most Red Army units in equipment and training. Counting the cost of maintaining military units and frontier guards, the annual budget of the OGPU equaled four million golden rubles a year. Foreign intelligence had a budget of three million dollars. OGPU agents had luxurious apartments and access to special stores with high quality goods. 
OGPU men considered themselves a chosen group, a state within a state. At the same time, however, they had special instructions to conduct political propaganda among the masses and establish firm contact with them in order to strengthen the authority of the OGPU. Directed from above, many Soviet organizations rendered formal support to the OGPU units. This epitomized the unbreakable connection between the people and the secret service. Liberal funding and abundant experience allowed the Soviet secret service to carry out several successful operations. One of the most famous was the arrest in 1924 of Boris Savinkov, an old and bitter enemy of the Soviets. Savinkov, a member of the SR combat organization, had lived in exile since 1918, awaiting a reversal of fortune for the anti-Bolshevik forces. The OGPU began its hunt for Savinkov. From 1921 until 1924, hundreds of people were arrested and charged with associating with him. Some of them betrayed the SR leader. But Savinkov could not be lured back into Soviet territory until he was offered leadership of a fictitious undercover organization. Artur Artuzov, the OGPU counterintelligence chief, supervised the operation, codenamed Syndicate 2. Undercover agent Andrei Fyodorov went abroad disguised as an anti-Bolshevik. He convinced Savinkov that the Russian people were waiting for him. After Savinkov and his companions crossed the border, Artuzov's deputy, Pilyar, arrested them in Minsk. The court reached a sensational verdict. Savinkov was not executed, but sentenced to 10 years in prison. In May 1925, however, he fell from a prison window. The OGPU ruled his death a suicide. During 1925, Stalin strengthened his position. His most important maneuver was the removal of Trotsky as Red Army Chief. But Mikhail Frunze, his successor, proved to be too independent and powerful for Stalin's liking. That year, Frunze conveniently died during surgery. He had been advised not to have the operation, a fact never mentioned in subsequent medical reports. Links existed between the secret police and the doctors. Command of the Red Army was given to Clement Voroshilov, who was fiercely loyal to Stalin. Voroshilov had been one of the Cheka's first agents. In 1925 saw another critical power play in the party. With Dzerzhinsky's active support, Sergei Kirov became secretary of the Leningrad City Party Organization. He replaced Grigory Sinoviev, leader of the new opposition, determined to check Stalin's growing political influence. Many historians believe that in the last months of his life, Dzerzhinsky became increasingly wary of Stalin. Yet his final public appearance was in the general secretary's support. At the Central Committee Plenum on July the 20th, 1926, he would criticize Stalin's opponents 
Georgi Piatakov and Lev Kamenev. Immediately after his speech, Dzerzhinsky collapsed. The doctor was somehow delayed. Two hours later, Dzerzhinsky would die in the arms of his subordinate, Abram Belenki. Dzerzhinsky's funeral was an important event for the Bolsheviks. For one last time, all the party leaders marched together. The position of each man in the honor guard signaled his political strength. As they buried Dzerzhinsky, the Bolsheviks said farewell not only to their comrade, but to an era. The period, which would later be called the Epoch of Romantic Revolutionary Terror, was over. On July the 30th, 1926, Vyacheslav Menzhinsky became chairman of the OGPU. Menzhinsky was born in 1874. He majored in law at St. Petersburg University and then joined the Bolsheviks in 1902. After the October coup, Menzhinsky became People's Commissar for Finance then Russia's general consul in Berlin. In 1919, he was transferred to the Cheka and later became Dzerzhinsky's deputy. Menzhinsky was very different from his colleagues. He was from the intelligentsia, an expert in physics and chemistry. He liked astronomy and spoke 20 languages. He was also a gentle man, which seemed a serious liability for one in his position. Trotsky described Menzhinsky as a shadow of a man, but this was what Stalin needed. Menzhinsky's appointment made Stalin the real and absolute master of the OGPU. Genrich Yagoda, Menzhinsky's second-in-command was Stalin's tool. As Stalin forged his reign of terror, the OGPU was involved at every step. The country was in the process of industrialization. grandiose plans and arbitrary deadlines were impossible to achieve. The careful planning of construction projects and the hard work of common workers were neutralized by chaos, mismanagement, and chronic shortages of even the most necessary supplies. The party could not blame their inexperienced and inept red directors. The Bolsheviks looked instead for a scapegoat. The OGPU provided a solution. Slow industrial development was blamed on sabotage by bourgeoisie specialists. The label was applied to the veteran engineers without Bolshevik allegiance. In 1928, a group of veteran engineers in the Donetsk coal basin was arrested. Falsely accused of counter-revolutionary activities. The Shahdi case, fabricated by the OGPU, was one of the earliest show trials. Stalin was not satisfied with the results. Only 16 of the 58 defendants pleaded guilty. In spite of intensive investigations, prosecutor Nikolai Krylenko could present no conclusive evidence of the defendant's grave offenses. The Supreme Court, headed by Andrei Vyshinsky, sentenced 11 engineers to death, but the government refused to approve the sentence and they were imprisoned.
for two years, Krylenko and the OGPU built a new case. Now saboteurs were revealed throughout the Soviet industries. Every enterprise was purged. Opposition party members and those without proletarian backgrounds were doomed. Tried by public courts, they were remanded to OGPU commissions and sent to prisons and labor camps. The Central Commission for Purges was headed by Yakov Peters. Late in the 1930s, the trumped-up trial of the non-existent industrial party, the Prompatia, took place. The OGPU corrected its earlier mistakes. There were only eight defendants. Most of them humbly confessed to erroneous crimes, testifying for the prosecution. Professor Leonid Ramzin, the alleged leader of Prompatia, and the seven other defendants had been coerced into confessing by the OGPU. Some other less cooperative defendants had been killed. In a show of mercy to those who confessed, the death penalty was imposed, but reduced to 10 years imprisonment two days later. At the same time, Russian peasants were subjected to harsh reprisals. The first stage of Stalin's collectivization began in 1928. Millions of peasants who did not want to join the collective farms were repressed. The kulaks, or rich peasants, were exiled. Any peasant could be considered a kulak. This theft was disguised as the struggle against the kulaks. Villages were deserted, prisons were overcrowded. Stalin devised a new plan to employ slave labor in building socialism. Convicts would be used up and discarded. Prisons and camps controlled by the Ministry of Justice were subordinated to the OGPU. This was the genesis of the infamous Gulag, the principal camp administration. Genri Yagoda was its first head. Solovki was the test site for the Gulag. In 1923, a model concentration camp had been set up on the grounds of the desolate and ruined Solovetsky Monastery, located on islands 20 miles offshore in the icy White Sea. During the six-month winters, there was no contact with the mainland. Inmates were humiliated and harassed, beaten and tortured. Many were executed without trial. The Gulag's primary economic principle was tested at Solovki, to extract the maximum labor at the lowest cost. In 1926, the Solovki camp produced 63,000 rubles worth of timber. In 1929, the figure had jumped to 3.5 million rubles, and a year later, it was 10 million rubles. The number of convicts increased from 3,000 in 1923 to 50,000 in 1930. Labor productivity increased 10 times. This was the Gulag economics. But harvesting timber, even on a tremendous scale, had little political effect. 
Stalin wanted a monumental construction project, which cheaply and quickly could give impressive results. The construction of a canal between the White and Baltic Seas began in September 1931. Thousands of convicts would be sacrificed for this enormous project supervised by the OGPU.